Gonzaga suffered just their 17th loss ever at the Kennel on Friday, and the season feels like it's starting to enter some scary and unfamiliar territory. So let's talk about it. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy New Year and welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics into the calendar year 2024. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more, folks. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks in your pocket if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. All right, folks, it is Monday. We are not doing our typical Mailbag Monday today because we are going to talk about what happened on Friday specifically we're going to talk about what that loss to San Diego State means for Gonzaga. It's kind of a, a therapy episode as we get out of 2023 into 2024. We're going to start the show talking about what happened in the game as well as what this means for Gonzaga, their resume, the NCAA tournament streak. Is it in jeopardy? What does this all mean? Could Gonzaga be out of the top 25? By the time you're listening to this, we may already have an answer to that question. We're just going to get all of those fears, worries, anxieties, stressors, anger, whatever it may be. We're going to get that flushed right out of here in this first segment. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about the game in detail, uh, what we saw, some of the good stuff, some of the not so good stuff against the Aztecs on Friday evening. And then we're going to close out the show, kind of flushing everything, moving to 2024. What can Gonzaga do to right the ship? What are the things that can change, that should change, that will change between now and March to help ensure that the Zags are A, in the big dance, which is not a conversation I hoped we'd be having, but also uh, setting them themselves up to potentially have some success uh, when we're going to stay positive here when they get into that conversation. So we'll start, of course, Gonzaga loses to San Diego State 84-74 at the Kennel on Friday evening. Uh, it was what we, we called a must-win game here on the podcast. Most other people address this as a must-win game, and Gonzaga didn't get it done. 84-74 final score there, 17th loss at the McCarthy Athletic Center since this place opened about 20 years ago. Uh, San Diego State's one of very, very few teams to have beaten Gonzaga twice uh, at the kennel. They did it back in 2010 with Kawhi Leonard on the roster, uh, did it again on Friday evening. Uh, winter break games are tough, and I, I want to be clear, it's not an excuse not an excuse for Gonzaga to, who have not executed here, not taken care of business in this game, but uh, we saw a lot of wonky results around the NCAA over this week, and I think it's one of those things that, that – uh, players are used to playing in front of their home crowd and, and their, their students. And when they don't get that opportunity, you can see some, some wonky results. We'll leave it at that. And certainly while this wasn't exactly a, a shock in the sense that San Diego state is a good team, uh, it certainly wasn't the Gonzaga we're used to seeing at the McCarthy athletic center. So the Zags fall to eight and four. They're eight and four on the year. They are two and zero in quad two games using the net rankings, the current net rankings as we're recording this on New Year's Eve. They are two and zero in quad three games. They are four and zero in quad four games. But the problem, the big big problem for Gonzaga, zero and four in quad one games. Of course, the losses to Purdue and UConn are losses that are entirely forgivable in the sense that two are those are two of the best. Five teams in the country, arguably three best teams in the country. UConn's resume took a bit of a hit with their loss to Seton Hall, but from a talent perspective, they're one of the five best teams in the country. Unquestionably, Purdue, probably the best team in the country. Certainly, they're the number one ranked team in the country for a reason, uh, but the, the Washington loss and the San Diego State loss are the problems. These are the, these are the losses that, that are damaging to Gonzaga's resume. They're damaging to Gonzaga's uh, reputation at this point, not in a significant way, like long-term, but for this season in particular, you got to be able to win the quad one games and Gonzaga has not been able to do it. And they've beaten other teams that we would have hoped would have been closer to that conversation that are not. So as much as it's easy to blame USC, blame UCLA to an extent, blame Syracuse, although they didn't have super high expectations at the end of the day, 
Gonzaga had opportunities to beat San Diego State. They had opportunities to beat Washington if they beat win both those games, which they were expected to do. They were favored to do. They should have done. You win both those games that the USC UCLA stuff doesn't matter. Yeah, it's still something we think about. And we're like, oh, man, it's a bummer that USC. I mean, they're terrible. They got beat by 16 to Oregon State on Saturday. This is a bad basketball team. Not just like, oh, they're struggling. They're bad. UCLA is beyond bad. They're they're really bad. UCLA is 144th in the net, folks. 144th in the net. Mick Cronin has all but given up on the season. It is clear by the way he speaks about this team. USC is, I think, one in five since Bronny James came back. Uh, it's not his fault, to be clear. That just was an expectation that that was going to lead this team, uh, kind of get them back on the right track, and it has done the opposite. Uh, they just are really, really struggling this season. But those two teams not being what they – anywhere close – to the preseason expectations is something that wouldn't have made as big of an impact on Gonzaga had they beaten Washington and San Diego state, but because they did not, they now are zero and four in their quad one opportunities. Their games against USC and UCLA don't mean nearly as much because they are quad two or quad three games at this point. Uh, and now Gonzaga's resume is in dire need of a big win and they don't have many opportunities to get it. And I think that's the big problem at Kentucky, February 10th. That is massive. And that's going to be really tough. It's going to be really tough. A lot's going to change between now and February 10th. So we're not going to sit here and try to preview that game at this point, but that is going to be a very, very tough matchup. John Calipari's young team is very good. They are cruising right now. Incredibly talented group of guards. They're just getting their front court healthy and situated. That's, that's a scary team. That's the only guaranteed quad one game left on Gonzaga's schedule. Now, St. Mary's on the road is probably going to be a quad one game. As much as St. Mary's has struggled this year, as we record right now, they are 51st in the net. A true road game just needs to be a top 75 net team. I do not think St. Mary's is going to fall out of the quad one conversation for Gonzaga on the road, but they got to win it in Moraga. They got to win it in Moraga. Their home game against St. Mary's probably not a quad one game unless St. Mary's climbs all the way into the top 30. Don't expect that to happen. San Francisco is 39th. I guess it's possible they could be a, a quad one game at home if they cl climb into the top 30. I don't expect them to just because they don't have many opportunities to pick up marquee wins. The road game against San Francisco, although it is at the Chase Center, will be a true road game for Gonzaga as, as per my understanding, which means they just need to be top 75. They are well within that threshold right now. So assuming Gonzaga wins uh, at San Francisco, at St. Mary's, that is two quad one games they will likely pick up. So it's a dose of optimism at that point. Uh, but again, that makes that Kentucky game extra important. If they can pick that one up, they have three quad one games. Still not going to be a super pretty resume. We know that. We know that. There's just no other way to look at it. It's whatever Gonzaga's, if Gonzaga is in the at-large conversation, that is going to be a, a factor. And that's kind of what I want to talk about now is, is Gonzaga's NCAA tournament streak in trouble? Mark Few's never missed the big dance as a head coach. He's been there since 1999, since 2000, I should say. Never, ever missed the NCAA tournament. Is it in trouble? A little, a little. It would be, at this point, it would be borderline malpractice to say no. It is a little bit in trouble. The WCC is a one-bid league. It looks pretty confidently like a one-bid one bid league. Gonzaga is the best team in the WCC. Nothing that has happened this season has changed that in my mind, in the mind of many other people, partly because St. Mary's has been pretty bad. So that helps Gonzaga still be in that conversation. San Francisco is good. They are better than they've been in the past. I think this is a good, dangerous, like tournament caliber team when they have the pieces together, but they don't have the resume to be an NCAA tournament at large team. And frankly, I don't think that they're better than Gonzaga. That doesn't mean that they couldn't clip them. And that's if, if Gonzaga plays them three times, it is possible San Francisco wins one of them. And if the one they win is at the Orleans Arena in Las Vegas, there could be some real trouble for the Zags. There's a lot of similarities right now for this Gonzaga team in the 2015-2016 team. It has not been that long. Maybe I'm just dating myself. It has not been that long since Gonzaga was in a position where they had to win in Vegas to go to the NCAA tournament. It feels like a long time because the year after that, they went to the NCAA national championship against uh, North Carolina. Since then, they've been to the big, they've been to the championship one other time. They've been to the Elite Eight multiple times. They have been this juggernaut program since 2017. And so I think the the feeling, the perception is that Gonzaga has well ascended past the point of being in danger of missing the NCAA tournament. But 2016 wasn't that long ago. And Gonzaga got it done. They won in Las Vegas behind 22 from Eric McClellan. DeMontis Simonis went nuclear in the NCAA tournament against Jakob Pertl at Utah in the second round. They went all the way to the Sweet 16, lost to Syracuse. 
that was the start of the Sweet 16 streak was the year that Gonzaga barely made the NCAA tournament. So there are some similarities, but it's also a, a reminder here as we get out of this kind of struggling segment to discuss, you know, the, the fears and concerns about Gonzaga. It's worth acknowledging. It's not like other blue blood programs don't miss the tournament. Sometimes this happens. Gonzaga's streak is incredible, monumental, unprecedented in the sport for a program that was an, a no name to have made the tournament as many years in a row as they have. Kentucky and Duke both missed the tournament in 2021. It wasn't even that long ago. North Carolina missed the tournament in 2023. They missed it last year. They also missed it in 2010. Guess what? Both of those times they missed the tournament, the previous year they had been in the, in the national championship. They won it in 2009, then missed the tournament in 2010. They were a runner-up in 2022 and then missed the tournament in 2023. So Gonzaga is not alone in being in danger of missing the tournament. I still believe they are going to make it, but it is worth acknowledging that it is not like, oh, they're, they're the program is in shambles if they don't, or even if they just barely sneak in. Again, in 2015-16, they barely snuck in. People were worried about the future of the program. The next year, they went 31-2 and two and were leading the national championship game with six minutes to go. So is the sky falling? A little. More than it has in the past. We will acknowledge that. But there is still a lot of season left, a lot of opportunities. Are, is Gonzaga going to be a top four seed? Are they going to play in Spokane? Almost certainly not. Almost certainly not. But it doesn't mean they're not going to make the tournament doesn't mean the Sweet 16 streak is necessarily over. If they get in the tournament, anything can happen. Uh, but, you know, it has been a rough start to the season, and it is fair to be pretty concerned about where this program is at this point this season. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dive a little bit more into the specifics of the San Diego State loss, the concerns, the things we didn't see, the things we wanted to see, as well as some of the things that we did see, some of the good things, some positive stuff that we can maybe take forward uh, the rest of the season, all of that coming up. After a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, as the weather gets colder, the college basketball offers stay hot on FanDuel. And right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. It's $150 in your pocket if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right now to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use. There is a wide range of betting options, which include spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. The ladies' eggs right now are at 10,000 to 1 odds to win the national championship. And look, I, I to quote Kevin Malone from The Office, you take 10,000 to 1 odds anytime you can get it. So if you want to join me in doing that, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action this college basketball season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, folks, segment two here, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags podcast, still out of town on vacation for those of you on YouTube noticing a different background here. What I want to do now is get a little bit more into the San Diego state of it all, the actual game on Friday. I suspect most of you, many of you probably watched the game, but for those of you who did not, we're going to talk a little bit about what actually happened. And really what I want to do is kind of what talk about what went wrong, because a lot of what went wrong on Friday is kind of what has been the issue for Gonzaga all year long. And the top of it is pretty simple. It's three words. The Zags can't shoot. They do so many other things well. They're a good defensive team, although their defense was suspect on Friday. But ultimately, at the end of the day, Gonzaga can out-rebound teams like they did. They can get more assists like they did. They can have a similar number of turnovers like they did. But if you can't put the ball on the hoop, you're going to lose games. It is not a lot more complicated than that, unfortunately. And in this game against San Diego State, Gonzaga shot 5 of 19 from 3. That is 26.3%. San Diego State is giving up 29% from 3 on the season, and it never felt like Gonzaga had a realistic opportunity to outshoot that. And they did not. 5 of 19 from 3, 42.4% from the field. Typically, Gonzaga is at least a quality two-point shooting team if they're not knocking them down from beyond the arc. But in this game on Friday, they weren't doing either particularly well. Like I said, more assists, more rebounds, similar number of turnovers, and they just got beat because they missed more shots. They did not convert on opportunities to score when they needed to do so. Points off turnovers was an issue, so while I acknowledge there was a similar amount of turnovers, San Diego State capitalized on those more. But again, what does that boil down to? If you score more points off turnovers than the other team when you had a similar amount, it's probably because you made more shots. Same issue for Gonzaga and Mark Fusine. They just weren't knocking down the shots when they needed to. 
And again, that has been an issue all season long for Gonzaga. The, the lack of a three-point shot has been a problem from game one. It remains an issue. It is hard to see an obvious solution to that unless Steel Venter's leg magically heals. That is a problem for Gonzaga. It is a problem that unfortunately is probably going to persist, and they may need to find ways to win games without it. Outside of that, bench depth. It's not there, and it's not getting played. That's the big issue in this game. Anton Watson, Ryan Nemhard both played the full 40. Every minute in this game, Nolan Hickman played 39 minutes. Those three guys have played pretty much every minute of every big game, and that was still the case on Friday against San Diego State. EK played 31 minutes. Dusty Stromer played 21 minutes. Ben Gregg played 20. We'll get to that momentarily. Braden Huff played just eight minutes. Yo played one, and that was it. That was it for the for Gonzaga's depth in this game. Once again, there isn't a lot of options. Mark Few is not utilizing the options that he has. He did not play Yo very much in this game. He did not play Huff very much in this game. Uh, Stromer didn't play very much in this one. And that was the freshmen weren't up to the task in this one. That's another issue for Gonzaga. That the depth and the three point shooting have been issues all season long. Freshmen not being up to the task hasn't necessarily been an issue all season long. Dusty, for the most part, has been great this year. Braden, for the most part, has been great this year. But neither of them got it done on Friday against San Diego State. They were a combined two of seven from the field, one of four from three. Not a ton of shot opportunities, but a part of that is because Stromer played 21 minutes, which is far under his season average. Braden played eight minutes, which, of course, is far under his season average as well. Part of the reason for that, for Dusty in particular, is that he picked up a technical foul in the second half. And look, it was the thing that happened was fairly minor. There was a, a bit of a kind of get in your face situation between Anton Watson. And I think it was Micah Parrish uh, from San Diego state. I believe that's who it was. Uh, and Dusty kind of got in there to, to break it up and, and put his hand on Parrish and pushed him away. Parrish uh, looked a little bit like a European soccer player, the way that he handled getting pushed, but I won't deny that Dusty did it. And he got called for the technical foul. That's typically how it goes. The second person to, to make a push, to make a, a move is the one who gets called. I don't think that that's necessarily the wrong call. It was the way that they responded to it. I, I I'm still chuckling at Roxy Bernstein calling that a shove, whereas there was incidences later in the game where people got pushed and they were like, oh, there's a little bump there. I'm like, okay, <laughs> Dusty's shove was, was a bit exaggerated for what it actually was, but uh, you can't do that. It was a freshman mistake. It was a freshman mistake that a freshman made and you can't do that. And if you guys were watching the game and you caught uh, the, the, clip, the, the clip of Mark Few on the sideline, uh, he was not yelling at the referees about that. He was yelling at Dusty Stromer in his face, completely red, screaming at Dusty Stromer. And that's what Mark Few does. And Mark Few then benched Dusty for the rest of the game. And there can be a conversation, maybe a longer conversation for a different show about whether that was the right decision. I know some people felt like, oh, he, you know, he didn't deserve to be benched for that whole time. You already got the tech, but blah, blah, blah. And there is some element of truth to that, but it's also worth acknowledging that at that point, from there on, Gonzaga actually got back into the game. So the, the benching of Dusty, while I don't think that Dusty was playing so bad that that was the problem, he, he was playing fine. He wasn't great, but he was fine. But Gonzaga got back into the game with the three big lineup. Ben Gregg came in, played the rest of the second half, and Gonzaga got back in the game. Then they fell out of it again and, and it ultimately ended up losing. But I, I think if, if Gonzaga continued to struggle, I think Dusty might have come back in the game. I think he was going to get benched for a certain period of time regardless because Mark Few just does not tolerate stuff like that. He never has. I, he shouldn't change that too now if he starts tolerating stuff like that and goes against you know everything he stood for as a coach. That's not what we want him to do. Him benching Dusty Stromer in that moment is the kind of thing that we have come to expect from Mark Few. And when the three big lineups started working, when Gonzaga got all the way back to within four, I could understand why Dusty then did not come back into the game. There was another momentum killer uh, because Graham E.K. committed a flagrant foul. It was it was a bad foul. He had his right hand on the ball. He had his left hand wrapped around the big and kind of pulled him back a little bit. It absolutely was a foul. I can kind of get why it was a flagrant foul. I don't love the call, but it, Graham, if he had his right hand on the ball, he didn't need to wrap his left hand around him. Graham made a mistake, just like Dusty made a mistake. You can argue about the calls. I was not happy, not thrilled about either call, but both players made mistakes. And they killed momentum because flagrant fouls and technical fouls really obliterate your momentum. Dusty's in particular, Gonzaga got the rebound and then Dusty commits the, and then there was a foul on Parrish. Then Dusty commits the technical. It basically wipes away the foul, gives them free throws and the ball back. A killer, killer play from Dusty Stromer. Beyond that, Ryan Nempard, 0 of 5 from 3. He's shooting 15%, folks, this season from 3. 15%. Andrew Nemhard, or excuse me, Ryan Nemhard's last made three-pointer 
was against Arkansas Pine Bluff on December 5th. December 5th, he's been one of 18 from three since the USC game. One of 18 from three since the USC game. He can't shoot. It's gone. He shot 35% last year, and it is not there right now. It's gone. The ability to shoot, and they weren't bad shots. I've said this before about Ryan Nembhard. I don't think he is taking bad shots. Every time he lined up a three, I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good shot. There was one that I remember thinking, oh, okay, I didn't love that shot. But most of the time, he's open. The play is designed in a way to get him an open look. He's got an open look. He takes the shot. It just doesn't go down. I don't think he's taking bad shots. But at this point, if you're one of 18, they almost all become bad shots, but you've got to find a way to shoot yourself out of it. And that is the hard part right now is what, how much leeway do you give Ryan Nembhard to find that outside shot? Because it's not there right now. The last big thing, the Zags don't, they just don't have that dude. They don't have that dude. Drew Timmy was that dude. Jalen Suggs was that dude going for, they've had plenty of dudes <laughs> past then, uh, but they don't have that guy. Anton Watson is great. He's not that guy. That's not who he is. Ryan Nembhard right now, not that guy. Graham E.K. at times can be that guy, but he's not really that guy. They just don't have him. They don't have him. And that's a big issue for Gonzaga. The signs of optimism, we'll get to him here really quickly. Outside the three-point shot, it was a nice game from Ryan Nembhard. 15 points, nine assists, five rebounds. Five of nine on two-point attempts. Five of seven from the free throw line. I thought he had a quality game. This did not make the three-point shots when he needed to. Graham E.K. may have had his best game as a Zag. 20 points, 10 rebounds, eight of 13 from the field, six offensive rebounds and two steals. I say this is his best game because it came against the best quality opponents that he has had this kind of game against. When they have played good opponents in the past, Graham has had good, but not great games. 20 and 10 against a good, physical, deep, big San Diego State team. Great performance from Graham. He also played good defense on Jaden Ladee, who had five of 12 shooting in this game. One of the He still finished with 20 points because he got a lot of them at the free throw line, but really good defense from Graham in this game. Zach also shot 76%, 19 of 25, from the free throw line, Anton Watson made a free throw that got wiped away by a lane violation. So they were actually a little better than that. That's a huge sign for them going forward. And like I said earlier, the Zags crawled back in a game. They were way behind. They crawled back to within four uh, in the second half. Showed a lot of fight, a lot of heart, a lot of tenacity. And as frustrating as this season has been, as frustrating as it is to watch this team lose to UW when they just did not have the energy or the horses to come back, for them to pull off a near comeback against San Diego State to come from 15, 16, whatever they were down, all the way back to within a possession or two possessions. I think it was a bit of three or four. I can't remember the closest they got. To get that close in this game shows that this team is not given up. And I don't think we should give up either. And that's what I want to talk about now. It's the start of a new year. As you're listening to this, for most of you, it is 2024. It is the beginning of conference play. So it is time to move forward. And we're going to look at what the rest of the season Looks like for Gonzaga, what they need to do to get back on track coming up right after this. All right, folks, final segment here. As we get into 2024, we're going to flush it. We're going to flush 2023. We're going to flush the eight and four start to the season, flush the loss to San Diego State. And we're going to look ahead because it's 2024. That's what you do. That's what you do when you get into a new year. And I think it is time to try to look forward as best we can. It doesn't mean we're not going to acknowledge what happened at the beginning of the season. It doesn't mean we're not, we're going to pretend that there's their record is zero and zero because it's not because Gonzaga is in a different situation heading into conference play than they've been in a very long time. And that is important for them to continue to know, but what can they do at this point to get themselves back into a position to not only comfortably make the NCAA tournament, but to be in a position to succeed when they get there. First things first, the next couple of weeks are pretty easy schedule wise. And when Gonzaga is playing as inconsistently as they are right now, we don't want to take anything for granted. However, Gonzaga opens up WCC play with home games against Pepperdine on the fourth and San Diego on the sixth. Those are two of the least good teams in the WCC. Currently, as we record this, 218th and 224th at Ken Palm. Not particularly good programs, two home matchups for Gonzaga. Then they go on the road at Santa Clara, and that's a tougher one, 125th at Ken Palm right now for the Broncos. But that is their only game of the second week of January. That is on January 11th on Thursday. It's their only game that week. And then the next week, they go on the road again, but it's at Pepperdine and at San Diego. So that is pretty much their the first three weeks of January. Two games against Pepperdine, two games against San Diego, one game against Santa Clara. 
that's a pretty cushy start to conference play for Mark Few and the Zags. So what can they do to get back on track? Continue to experiment with lineups. Gonzaga has to figure out what's going to work for them. What lineup's going to be the best long-term? What lineups work just in spurts? How can they get some rest for the guards? I mean, these are things we've talked about all season long, and they continue to be issues for Gonzaga. What does that mean? Well, the three big lineup worked against San Diego State. Does that mean Gonzaga runs it more? Does that mean Gonzaga runs it more and finds ways to alter it to, you know, they run a different offense, they run a different defense because there are flaws with it. I don't think it's typically a, a set that they should run for 15 minutes, but they did it against San Diego State. And in a lot of ways it worked. Part of that was because they ran the three big lineup and they put Anton Watson at the front of a one, two, two zone press and San Diego State looked like they'd never seen a press before in their life. It was very odd, quite honestly, to see San Diego State struggle so much with that press, but that is what the length of Anton Watson can do on the front. And when you have two six foot 10 guys and Graham E.K. and Ben Gregg playing at the back, it can cause some challenges. Does that mean they continue to experiment with playing this three big lineup with this one, two, two zone press? Perhaps. It worked against a pretty good team. Maybe that's something they continue to do. Maybe we continue to see more of Jun Suk Yo something we talked about a lot on this podcast and we started to see more from him and then suddenly we didn't. I didn't expect to see much of him against San Diego State and we did not. But is that something we're going to see more of? His growth, his development is vital to Gonzaga's success this season. I continue to believe that and yet we're still not seeing a lot of him. Is this a coaching issue? Is Mark Few making a mistake not playing Yo more? Possibly. Is there something we're not seeing about why he's not getting minutes in these kind of games? Maybe. Certainly. There's always something we're not seeing. But I think for, for the Gonzaga to be able to have the depth needed to win in March, to be able to even have the depth needed to win this season and in the WCC tournament, Yo needs to be a rotation guy or at least more consistent on the floor than he has been up to this point this season. Sliding Dusty to the two, giving Hickman and or Nemhart a break, that's valuable. Yo's defense is valuable. His offense has been coming around. And speaking of that, another big important thing for Gonzaga in 2024 is the continued growth and development of their younger players. Yo is, of course, included in that. So is Dusty Stromer. He looked like the freshman on Friday, like we said. He looked like a freshman. He made a freshman mistake. It happens. It happens. It's one of those things. We've been pretty impressed with the fact that Dusty hasn't made a lot of freshman mistakes up to this point. He's been very level-headed. He's adjusted to a role that he wasn't expected to have, uh, and he's filled it very admirably. But mistakes are going to happen. How do you learn from that? How do you grow from that? That is something that is going to be very, very important for Mark Few to figure out how does Dusty respond to adversity? How does he respond to getting benched? Uh, that's really valuable. Braden Huff, he has not showed up in these big games. The season is not in the spot that it is because of Braden Huff not showing up. He wasn't expected to, everything we've gotten from Braden Huff has been kind of gravy in the sense that he wasn't expected to be a big contributor before the season started, but we could have really used him against San Diego State and he wasn't really there. What can he do to continue to develop? Because the upside is still very high. And he took good shots on Friday. He had a couple open threes where I was like, this was a designed play to get him an open three on a pick and pop. He ran the play perfectly. He caught the ball. He had his feet set. He took an open three, just didn't make it. That happens. It's happened way too much for Gonzaga this year. And that is frustrating to continue to have the conversation of they're taking good shots. They're not making them because at some point, if you can continue to not make the shots, they may not be good shots. Brayden Huff's a 40 something percent three point shooter coming into this game. At least it's probably dropped a little bit, but he should be taking those shots. And I like that he still is, but the development is to continue to stay confident, to continue to find those open looks, to continue to produce, not just against teams in the SWAC conference but against Pepperdine, against San Diego, and then eventually against St. Mary's, against San Francisco, and hopefully against whoever plays whoever Gonzaga plays in the NCAA tournament. Luka Krajinovic is back at the end of the month. What does that look like? He's not going to step in and start playing a big role. He's probably not going to play very much in the time that he does get back because he wasn't playing much before, and, and Gonzaga's hesitant to throw guys back into the mix when they come off of injuries. But in the month of February, Gonzaga gets Pacific twice. They get Portland twice. Those two teams are pretty darn bad. Could Krinovich get some time to develop? Maybe it doesn't help him as much this year other than getting Nempard and Hickman some more breaks, but it could help them next year at least. And that's valuable too. Getting him some reps, some opportunities to grow and develop on the basketball court this season is important as well. Those are the main things. I think the other big thing is this Kentucky game. It's critical to win it, but if they don't, even if they don't, playing this game against Kentucky at Rupp Arena in February is vital experience for March. It makes you better. 
It makes you better to play against a really good team in a really tough road environment in February, something Gonzaga doesn't get to do very often. And they won't get to do this year because St. Mary's just isn't that good. It's still going to be a loud environment when they play at Moraga. I think St. Mary's is still going to give him a game because Randy Bennett does not like to just roll over and let Gonzaga beat him. He's not going to want to do it after last year's WCC tournament. But at the end of the day, those two games in Moraga and uh, in at, in Lexington against against Kentucky at Rupp, those are valuable games for Gonzaga to get that experience of playing in hostile crowds before March Madness. There are a lot of things Gonzaga can do to, to turn this thing around. Again, they're not going to be a top four seed in the NCAA tournament. It's not going to happen. Their, their streak of being an AP top 25 team very possibly has come to an end by the time you're listening to this. The expectations for Gonzaga are different than they were to start the season, than they were to start the month of December. They're different. We're in a different spot now. But that does not mean the season is over. That does not mean that Gonzaga's run as a powerhouse basketball program is over. Far from it. Those are extreme overreactions that most people are not having, but it's important to acknowledge. But it does mean that Gonzaga's expectations are different and that they still need to find ways to win basketball games now more than ever to put themselves in a position to still keep that streak alive and find themselves in the NCAA tournament where at that point anything can happen. You get into the big dance, you reset your season, you go from there, you find ways to just win one game at a time. Just like they did in 2015. They barely snuck, or 2016, they barely snuck into the big dance. Most people thought, okay, they made it good for them, they're going to lose in the first round. They didn't. Oh, good for them, they're going to lose to Utah. They didn't. Made it to the Sweet 16. You never know. Could happen again. Could happen again. We're going to be back on Wednesday talking more about what happens with the AP poll, getting a little bit ready for the game against Pepperdine, all that good stuff coming up later this week here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Thanks to all of you who listened in 2023. Thanks to all of you who have already listened here in 2024. Looking forward to our, looking forward to our fantastic year on the Locked On Zags podcast. It's going to be a, a really fun one, even if this season uh, has different expectations than usual. So once again, I want to thank you all for being here with me uh, as we get into 2024. Uh, and until next time, As always, go Zags.